We're in the season before Christmas, the season of Advent. And so what we will do during these four Sundays in the season of Advent is look at passages from the Bible that preceded the birth of Jesus Christ. Words that were written well before that first Christmas, and yet words that ultimately find their fulfillment only in one person, and that is Jesus who came at Christmas time so that he could grow up and live and suffer and die and rise again to draw us as sinners unto the presence of God. And so as we look at these different passages, we will find that ancient words only find their fulfillment in Christ Jesus, and such is the case for today. And so the first passage that we're going to look for for this, the first Sunday in Advent, is our psalm, Psalm 122. I love the book of Psalms. If you've ever spent any time in the book of Psalms, you know that all of the 150 psalms were ancient songs that the Israelites would sing to God. It was kind of like a a prayer book that the people would use to guide them in their worship. And so as they would come together and worship, as they would plan for a worship service, they would draw all of their songs from that book of Psalms. And the whole gamut of emotions is expressed in the Psalms. If you're feeling tired and weary, there's words for you there. If you're feeling, feeling hopeful and excited, there are words for you there. If you're feeling downcast and disturbed, there are words for you in the Psalms. If you're feeling uplifted and celebratory, there are words for you in the Psalms. No matter what emotion you're feeling in life, it is expressed in that book of the Psalms. And what I love about it, as we as the people of God go through all of those different types of emotions in life, is that this book in the Bible reminds us that there is nothing inherently wrong with any of those emotions but the encouragement and direction of God's Word is to bring them all to Him. So even if we're angry, we bring it to God. If we're distressed, we bring it to God. If we're rejoicing, we bring it to God. We bring all things to God because He is a Father who loves to know what's going on in His children's lives. And so it is with the reading for today, Psalm 122. This section in the book of Psalms from Psalm 120 through Psalm 134 was called the Songs of Ascents. We talked about in the Apostles' Creed today that after Jesus had descended into hell and then rose again from the dead, He ascended into heaven. That is, He was lifted up into heaven. And so the Songs of Ascents here in Psalm 120 through 134 are all songs that were sung when God's people went up to worship the Lord in Jerusalem. So no matter what direction they were coming from, they were always going up because Jerusalem was situated on a hill. So physically, you went up to Jerusalem. And yet more than that, it speaks of going up because your spirits are lifted up because you are going to the presence of God where He revealed Himself in that ancient temple in a special way that was found nowhere else in the world. And so God's people went up, they went up in their spirits, and as they went, they sang these songs of ascents. Most likely, they would have been sung together. Maybe this side would sing one verse and this side with another. Maybe the men would sing and then the women would sing, or they would shout something in unison, similarly to how we use songs and responses in church today. So imagine with me this morning, God's people going up to worship Him in Jerusalem And they say these words or even sing these words together from Psalm 122. It says, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. Have you ever found yourself saying to another person, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. Maybe it was Black Friday morning and one of you was saying, let's go, we got to get to Target. Let's go. We got to get to Best Buy. And yet that person in bed with you was still sleeping off their turkey coma. And you said, come on, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. We got to get out there. Maybe you were watching Center Grove versus Carmel in that state championship game. And you were shouting at the TV or shouting at the players on the field. Let's go. Let's go. Maybe it was yesterday. Ohio State versus Michigan. What a friendly rivalry, isn't it? 
<laughs> Actually not. Let's go. Let's go. People were shouting all over social media for their team. They were excited. They were cheering the athletes on. And they wanted something to rejoice in. Well, also this command that comes before us here today says, let's go to the house of the Lord. It reminds me of a story that a lady in our congregation shared with me of what it was like growing up with three kids in their house as she and her husband were raising three kids, two daughters and, and one son. And the kids all have fond memories now. At the time, they didn't like it, but they remember on Sunday morning, their dad would stand at the bottom of the stairs and he'd be yelling up the stairs, let's go, let's go, it's time for church, let's go. And there was always one, the oldest daughter, who was so slow and had to be told, let's go. But that was a pleasant memory for these kids as they've grown up of their dad saying, let's go to the house of the Lord. You see, what a reminder this is that going to the house of the Lord is a reason for joy. A reason for joy. When God's people went up to Jerusalem, they knew that God would meet them there in a way that they couldn't find Him anywhere else. And such is also the case for us when we come to this, the house of the Lord, in worship. For we can have joy of knowing that God is present with us in a way that He's not present anywhere else. He's present with His Word as He comes to us and speaks into our hearts. He's present by announcing to us the forgiveness of all of our sins. He's present in giving us His Son's body and blood to nourish us in our faith and to make us one with Christ and one with other people. He's with us in a special way that after we've laid our prayers and our praises at His feet, He places His blessing upon us and says, now that you've come, now you go. And let's go out there and share a little bit of what you've received here. So let's go to the house of the Lord. And let's go with joy so that when God says the word, let's go, we go back into the world and we express to the world who he is and what he has done. God's children say, let's go. It's a cause of great joy. And then they finally arrive in verse number two. They arrive in Jerusalem the capital city, the center of their life of faith, and they say, our feet are standing in your gates, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. So standing in the middle of Jerusalem, that holy city where they would come to the temple of the living God, they see that Jerusalem is the city of peace. The city of peace. That's what Jerusalem means. It means city of peace. Of peace. It is at the center of God's people's lives. So no matter if they're coming from north or south, east or west, they go up to Jerusalem, the city of peace, and there they are at the hub of their journey. As we walk through this text together this morning, think about Jerusalem, at least for now, as Mount Olive. That Mount Olive is like Jerusalem, You've said to one another, you've said to your family this morning, Let, let's go to the house of the Lord. We're going to go meet with God in a very special way as He comes to us in His Word and Spirit, and we come to Him in our prayers and praise, and then He's going to send us back out. But let's go, and we're going to meet Him here. And Mount Olive becomes for us the city of peace, the place where God gives peace to the hearts of those who are troubled where God gives forgiveness to the hearts of those who are filled with sin, where God gives hope for those who are hopeless. God gives joy for those who are joyless. God is giving you a gift here. And so think of Mount Olive as your city of peace. That people all around us from the north, south, east, and west have come and this becomes a centerpiece of their life. That this first day of the week, this Sunday of the week, this day on which Jesus rose from the dead becomes the day in which they gather, gather together so then they can go out and scatter as well. That Mount Olive is like a hub where all of God's children come together and be focused upon what the Lord is doing among them. Where we set aside our individual lives and we unite as one people filled with the presence of Jesus who is the Prince of Peace. 
that this place would be a place where we would know that this season of the year is about Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. That if you would go to the checkout line and see people wanting to slug out who's going to be in first place, there may not be any peace. When a person cuts you off in traffic and waves a certain finger in your way, you don't find peace. But here you can set all of that aside and find in this the city of peace, the core and the center of it all, who is Jesus touching your life. This becomes the hub where God's people gather so then they can scatter. Verse 4, that is where, so for our sake, Mount Olive is where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to praise the name of the Lord according to the statute given to Israel. What had God commanded His people Israel? That they would fear and love and trust in Him above all things. That He would have first place in their lives. That they would worship His name. That they would walk in obedience to His commands. This is the place where they hear that word and they make their commitment known unto Him. This is where the tribes go up and there stand the thrones for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. So in the ancient times, all of the tribes of Israel would go up with their different tribes to the house of the Lord. They'd be singing the psalms. They'd be worshiping together. They'd be sacrificing together. And they were marked by different names. And those names were all the sons of Jacob who became the tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel. And that marked them in their unique identities. But the tribes remind us that they are families that worship together. That you worship as a family together much like we see at Mount Olive today. The tribes maybe don't have the names of Issachar and Naphtali and Zebulun, but they do have the names of Zoss, Anderson, Davis, Owen, Blazik, Wilson, and I could go on and on. We hear the names of these different tribes, and yet what happens when the tribes come together in this, the city of peace? Those who are individual become one. For here in this house of the Lord, this hub of God's people's lives, we're no longer separate, but we are one family in Jesus. And as a family, we watch out for other family members. If you see a family member that is missing in God's house, you reach out to them and tell them that they are missed. If you see a family member that is struggling, you reach out to them and support them in their struggle. If you see a family member that's rejoicing, you come alongside of them and rejoice along with them. We are one family that worships together. Though we are many tribes, together we come to the house of the Lord as the ancients do. And what do we do when we gather? We pray. We pray and we praise the Lord on high. Verses 6 through 9 says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So think about that. Pray for the peace of the city of peace. So pray for the peace of the city of peace. Pray for the peace of Mount Olive. Pray for the wholeness and the well being of a place like this. Why do we do that? Why do we do that? Well, we read on. May those who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels that God would guard and protect us from every attack of the evil one who comes to seek and kill and destroy that we would have Jesus who has come to have life. We pray for peace for the city of peace for the sake of my family and my friends. So we pray for the peace and the well-being of our church. Why? For the sake of other people. So that people who are alive right now might meet Jesus here. And that people who are out there not connected to the Christian church might hear of Jesus because of the people here. And that your kids and grandkids and great-grandkids and all those who are coming after you might be able to meet Jesus here. We pray for the well-being of God's church for the sake of my family and my friends. I will say, peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. The Old Testament people were praying 
All those tribes at the hub, the center of their life coming together as one, they prayed for three specific things, it says. They prayed for peace, they prayed for security, they prayed for prosperity. How can we understand those, th- those three petitions? First of all, peace. Peace means wholeness. It says, I am whole. That I am a complete person. That in the Lord Jesus Christ, God has taken me as a broken person, for we are all broken people. And He has made me whole because of the blood of Christ shed for me. I am whole. We pray for peace. We pray for security. That says, I am right. The world may be in turmoil, and yet my soul is right with God. Because Jesus Christ has made me right with the Father through His death and resurrection. I am secure in His presence. I'm secure in my relationship with God. I am right with Him. So I am whole. I am right. And I seek prosperity. Does that mean that you have tons of worldly wealth? No, but prosperity in the, in, in the understanding of the Scripture says I am well taken care of. That I trust that God will meet all of my needs according to His riches in Christ Jesus. That the God who is my Father will take care of me because through faith in His Son, I am His Son. I am His daughter. I am His child. And I have peace, security, and prosperity. I am whole. I am right. I am well taken care of. I think about those things that are needed by pretty much anyone you meet, peace and security and prosperity. Up here at the Advent wreath, we'll be lighting different candles throughout this month as we focus upon the different needs that all human beings have. Today, we lit the candle of hope, knowing that everybody needs confidence for the future. Everybody needs an outlook for the future that is positive. Then we'll light the the candle of peace. Doesn't everyone need to be whole? Doesn't everyone need to have that stillness of heart and life? Don't we light that pink candle, the candle of joy? Isn't that something that every human being needs? A reason to celebrate, lift up their spirits. Then we'll light that candle of love. And who doesn't need love? Love that fills us up so that we can fill others up. Love among our families. Love among our brothers and sisters. Love among our friends who doesn't need it but notice all of those candles just like all of those petitions in psalm 122 for peace and security and prosperity only find their fulfillment in the center of it all that the reason why we from all different angles from north south east and west from faraway places like mooresville and monrovia like bargersville and trafalgar like franklin like greenwood like indianapolis that all come together in the hub here because at the center of it all stands jesus the christ the one whose candle we will light on christmas reminding us that these gifts ultimately come to the ancients and they come to us in one person who is Jesus. So why do we go to the house of the Lord? We come here because Jesus is here. And He who is the center of our life centers us on Himself so that when we flow forth, we may take Him out into the world. So friends, even before Christmas, We rejoiced with those who said to us, let's go to the house of the Lord. And because of Christmas, we say the same, let's go to the house of the Lord.